on the DSA, its future enforcement and the protection of uh, fundamental rights. Uh, the panel is organized uh, by the DSA Observatory, which is a project uh, that is running at the University of uh, Amsterdam at the Institute for Information Law. Uh, what I will do is uh, I will introduce myself, uh, my uh, co-moderator and chair and uh, the speakers uh, for today. And uh, then I will hand it over uh, to Ilaria for some opening remarks uh, about the substance and the focus of the panel. Uh, I'm Joris van Hoboken. I'm an associate professor at the Institute for Information Law and a professor of law at the LSTS uh, group at uh, uh, the Vrije Universiteit uh, Brussels. Um, I'm joined uh, here in the, also we organized uh, this together. Uh, I'm joined by Ilaria Buri. Ilaria is a research fellow uh, at the DSA Observatory Project at the, at the Institute uh, for in Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, then we have uh, four speakers. Um, the first uh, speaker will be uh, Jana Guz, uh, legal policy advisor uh, to Alexandra Giese, uh, a Greens uh, MEP in the European Parliament. Um, then uh, hopefully uh, who will join us uh, still uh, Paul uh, Nemitz, uh, uh, Principal Advisor at DG Justice at the European Commission. Then uh, Eliska uh, Pirkova, Europe uh, Policy Analyst and Global Freedom of Expression Lead uh, at Access Now. And Elliot uh, Bendinelli, Senior uh, Technologist at uh, Privacy International. So, um, just for everybody that is in uh, the session, uh, everybody in the audience, uh, this uh, uh, session is live streamed and uh, recorded. Um, just as a, a quick point on the format of the session, we have asked all the speakers uh, to give some relatively short uh, opening remarks, uh, three, four minutes. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we will have a little bit more uh, fluent discussion and also, of course, will involve uh, the audience. Um, so you can uh, type your questions, of course, uh, into the chat, into the public chat. Um, you can also indicate uh, whether you want to uh, come, um, uh, like open your camera or ask the question uh, yourself. Uh, so just say that you have a, a question and we will pick it up uh, like that. Um, please uh, do keep your cameras and uh, microphones closed uh, if you are not uh, speaking. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, give the floor to Ilaria for some uh, quick opening remarks on the substance of the session. I did hear you before, so... At the moment, you're muted. No, I can't hear you. Try to refresh the page, it says, as a... Yeah. yeah, something with your microphone. I maybe you should try to refresh, uh, come into the session again. But if I'll just give it a minute because I want to give her a chance to say the things she, she prepared. Yeah.
technology doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. I'm back. Yeah, we can hear I you. Hope Great. <laughs> okay. I have no idea what happened. I'm really sorry. Um, no, I mean, it's like late, late. It worked at the late beginning the and it just uh, stopped. Yeah, we so it took a you. moment. Yeah. We, we waited. Like, so please, please uh, take yeah. it away. So, thanks so much, Yoris, for uh, opening the session and everybody, including in the audience, uh, for, for waiting a couple of minutes now. Uh, so I will just say a few words to to introduce um, uh, the substance of of this session. So uh, the main idea uh, behind uh, the panel uh, session today and the very many questions that uh, it wants to explore uh, is the idea of creating a space uh, for discussion uh, for one of the most uh, central aspects. Uh, of the DSA process, uh, which is the question of its future enforcement um, within the framework that is now uh, taking shape uh, in, in the discussions, um, and the question of whether um, these rules uh, will be capable to deliver a high level of protection uh, of fundamental rights and other uh, democratic values. Uh, so this topic of DSA enforcement, uh, despite being uh, clearly uh, one of the most prominent of, of the proposal uh, and, and very central as to whether the, the DSA will or not achieve in the future its policy objectives, um, has not uh, received a lot of attention over the past months because uh, other topics, also rightfully, uh, have taken center stage and, and this topic has been a bit overshadowed by, by other uh, issues. Uh, so uh, the reason why we think it's really, really important that we talk about enforcement today uh, is because we know, particularly from experience uh, with the enforcement of GDPR, that even the most ambitious uh, um, set of uh, rules uh, do not translate automatically in high level of protection of fundamental rights uh, without uh, strong and consistent uh, enforcement uh, structures. Um, and, and there is no doubt in this case that uh, the, the, the many shortcomings, the failures in the enforcement of GDPR, uh, he influenced heavily uh, the, the DSA discussions, starting from the, the first commission proposal to the following uh, negotiations, um, particularly with this idea of a more uh, centralized uh, commission enforcement uh, against uh, dominant platforms emerging really as um, the most uh, promising solution uh, to try to avoid uh, the reoccurrence of some of the biggest failures uh, that happened with the enforcement of GDPR. And, and, and the rationale behind this type of choice is, is very clear, is, uh, is understandable, but we think it also raises a couple of complex and interesting questions that are very worth uh, discussing today and in the coming months. Um, now, when it comes to uh, enforcement uh, against um, big platforms, uh, one of the most interesting aspects uh, concerns uh, the, the supervision and enforcement of their obligations to uh, identify and to mitigate uh, systemic societal risks. 
And in particular, we saw over the past months, uh, over the last few days, last week in particular, that uh, systemic issues um, such as that connected to business model choices and uh, uh, surveillance-based advertising uh, really emerged at some of, as some of the most heated uh, topics uh, in, in, in the entire DSA discussion. Um, and these are all questions on which the uh, Parliament report from last week uh, takes a more ambitious uh, stance compared to the Commission and the Council's text, and, and we'll talk about it. Um, from this perspective, uh, we think that one of the most interesting questions for today um, is certainly the question of whether uh, the, the DSA provisions, and particularly the risk uh, systemic risk management mechanism um, where enforced properly uh, has the potential uh, to deliver a high level of protection of fundamental rights and other uh, democratic values, um, including with regard to uh, some of the most uh, striking distortions um, uh, and, and violations of fundamental rights that are brought about uh, by uh, some um, uh, business models uh, dynamics. And, and more in general, another question we'd like to, to discuss with you today is the question uh, of the potential challenges that we can already identify and anticipate today uh, with respect to the implementation and the enforcement uh, of, of the DSA. Um, so I think I've spoken enough. Uh, I won't speak further uh, to not take away any um, uh, more precious time from the conversation with our speakers. Um, um, as Joris already said in the introduction, we have uh, four uh, great panelists today and they all have outstanding uh, experience uh, both in the DSA and in the GDPR uh, debates. Um, so I'm now giving the floor to our first uh, speaker today, Jana Goth. Uh, Jana is legal and policy advisor to uh, MEP Alexandra Giese. Uh, Jana, you've been uh, super busy over the past months, uh, uh, over the past year with the DSA negotiations, just back from uh, last week's uh, plenary in Strasbourg. Uh, so we are very curious to hear uh, from you, from your vantage point on the DSA, um, what's your impression of the DSA uh, enforcement chapter? Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Ilya. Um, so I very much agree with one of the first things that you said, and that is that this entire enforcement chapter received way too little attention over the over the last months, both in public discourse as well, in my view, within the negotiations, because we negotiated it chronologically from front to end um, of, the, of the DSA, and I think it's the same, which naturally led to the enforcement chapter being one of the very last things being negotiated and discussed. And as you might have, as you might know, um, there was a huge time pressure on the rapporteur to uh, bring the file to to a close. So, uh, in in my humble view, I don't. I think we could have spent more time uh, debating these things and negotiating on these uh, on these issues than than we did. Uh, in particular, as I completely agree as well that we we had to learn from our experience with GDPR. In my prior life, uh, before I joined Ms. Giza as a policy advisor, I was working at a lawyer and advising big tech clients on uh, well on uh, on on GDPR and also vis-a-vis -vis the DPAs and uh, proceedings that they had with them. Uh, so I was able to draw from that experience and trying to bring it into, in particular, how we can uh, how we can improve enforcement under the DSA, which was one of uh, one of uh, the Greens' main priorities for the file. Um, so what we did uh, procedurally internally was. Uh, really take a close look into into what GDPR offers in this regard and then draw our conclusions from there and based uh, based on the experience there. 
try to translate that into a better enforcement chapter um, for uh, for the DSA. So uh, the first thing that we thought needed fixing in comparison to GDPR was that we felt the need to introduce fixed deadlines for every step of the proceedings wherever possible. This is something that, uh, that we've seen in regards to Ireland. Um, I personally, for example, lodged a complaint um, with, uh, with my respective uh, DPA in Germany, um, together with uh, none of your none of your business back in 2018, actually already, and we haven't heard yet uh, from from the Irish DPA. There isn't even a first draft decision, and that is because there's no fixed deadline for them to actually come up with one of those uh, draft decisions. So we can't even um, go to court yet. We can't appeal a decision that isn't in existence yet. So uh, that was that was one thing that we as Parliament did uh, amend in comparison to the Commission draft as well was to to just introduce deadlines everywhere where they are missing. There were already lots of them in there. The Commission obviously also did their work and uh, also saw this problem already. We just touched up on some on some aspects of that in, in this regard, and then. Um, the second uh, big topic that uh, all institutions, uh, in fact, tackled was that um, a bit more centralization uh, in regards to enforcement does not do us any harm here. Of course, we have the country of origin principle and, of course, uh, also under the DSA. Uh, in principle, the, the digital service coordinator of establishment shall be uh, shall be in power of the proceedings, that's clear. But uh, in particular, in regards to the very large online platforms, we felt the need that we, there's, there's, uh, there's the real need for more centralized enforcement. A, because obviously like these, um, these issue, issues are naturally cross-border. They touch upon every member state citizen's interests. Uh, B, that's also some might have seen with Ireland uh, in regards to GDPR is that Sometimes a member state's uh, financial interests can be so intertwined with uh, the financial interests of the of the tech companies uh, doing their business there. If there are thousands and thousands of jobs depending on these companies having their main establishment there, that it might not be the wisest decision to uh, lay basically all enforcement powers onto them. Uh, and uh, C, of course, uh, we will need a huge pool of uh, technically uh, and legally very um, very expert uh, people to be able to work on these enforcement um, questions. So uh, we, for example, as Greens, uh, we pushed for having an actual EU um, platform agency uh, that should be in charge for the enforcement vis-a-vis -vis the very large online platforms and in regards to their special obligations. That didn't find a majority, unfortunately. So um, we are in this regard, more or less, uh, still um, with the with the commission proposal, where the commission will do some of these uh, will have some of these powers. Um, I think we can talk more about this uh, in detail later. There, are, of course, uh, benefits and uh, cons to to having the commission do. Um, do these tasks, but overall, in general, I would say it's a good development that uh, we're aiming for a bit more centralization uh, in regards to enforcement. And uh, maybe as a last general remark, uh, which I think we can also touch upon later more in detail, is that um, if you compare the three texts that we have now, so the Commission text, the uh, Parliament text, and the Council text, is um, actually a combination of all three of them uh, would would bring us benefits right now. Classically, of course, the EP is always um, yeah, maybe a bit bashing the commission's, uh, sorry, the council's proposals. But uh, here for the DSA, um, the council, in my view, or in the Greens view, did, um, did good work uh, on the enforcement chapter. And there are lots of good provisions in there, strengthening, for example, the commission uh, in the enforcement interest that we in the uh, EP text are lacking. On the counter side and the EP text, we have some, um, some, some fixed deadlines introduced that were lacking in the in the council draft and also, as you mentioned, Ilaria, the provisions on um, the risk assessment and the audits, which, uh, of course, would be great if they would find um, their way into the trilogue text. So uh, it really remains to be seen what we end up with after trilogue. And um, I think there are very good aspects in all uh, three texts that uh, if we if we achieve to combine them, uh, I think we're left with something um, pretty effective. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And it does sound like you did actually do quite a lot of work, uh, but of course, maybe some of those uh, enforcement discussions are rather technical and not so easy also to translate to a bigger audience. Paul, 
Paul Nemitz, uh, Principal Advisor at the uh, Digital Justice at uh, the European Commission. Uh, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would say like uh, on GDPR, we are really here in a finding process uh, where the institutions uh, engage um, and uh, I really mean this, uh, you know, for example, in GDPR, if you remember, uh, the Commission actually didn't dare to, uh, in its original proposal, to have to propose anything where there was a strong center. It was a very weak center in the original proposal. And then the member states in the Council uh, uh, developed these thoughts about, you know, what does it mean if we have complete decentralization, you know, given the fact that Google and others sit in Ireland, you know, how is that going to work for our citizens? And this is how, um, uh, let's say, the powers of um, the Data Protection Board were created uh, to give, uh, let's say, binding decisions on the way forward in, in some cases. And I see the same type of constructive engagement now uh, on DSA. And I would agree that in uh, uh, both of the texts, Parliament and Council, there are really steps forward. And um, I, I think the, the Commission is very uh, much looking forward to seeing sort of, you know, this constructive attitude continue. In the end, uh, I would say all institutions are in it here to make things work. And that is a big challenge in this new world. And um, uh, let's say, um, you know, we have to push as far as we can. But I would also say, you know, without thinking that there is this or that perfect solution. I think in particular comparisons to GDPR, they are helpful to some extent. Um, but I would caution against, uh, let's say, and, and, you know, the tonality is sometimes a little bit like that, a discourse which is, you know, oh, you know, GDPR doesn't function and now we have to draw the consequences. The opposite is true. If you look at uh, the fines, uh, you know, we just have a year behind us where the fines have very substantially increased and they will further increase. We have now an upward uh, competition. You know, the U.S. is still leading with a billion fine, uh, two, two, two billions of Facebook fine from the FTC. But um, complex enforcement systems, first of all, are never perfect if from a scientific point of view or from this or that political uh, point of view, never. Um, and they need some time to fall into the kinetics. And I think the kinetics... Um, uh, in the in the GDPR system are good in the sense that there is a real threat that these central authorities can act and they they are starting to learn this um, if the lead authority is not acting. So um, um, I would say there are also some other things which are not parallel and that's important to keep in mind. So first of all, we don't have the issue or the problem of this multiplication of constitutional level independence of an authority. You know, that is a blessing on the one hand, but it's also a problem because, you know, if you have constitutional independence, you know, it makes people think they are, you know, the only ones who have uh, an interest here. And this obstacle, we don't have the, in the DSA. So we can think about an institutional setting, uh, which, uh, which, which works, but uh, which does not create this, um, you know, this, this very special class of constitutionally protected independence, you know, and this discourse, for example, which was very much in the GDPR discussions against the commission. Huge mistake. I mean, the commission is the most independent body uh, of all, according to the treaty. If you, if you look at the rules of the treaty, the commission is very independent, which leads me to a second point. You know, the good old discussion, do we need a, a body outside of the commission to enforce or inside? I think there are, as Jana said, you know, this is an old discussion on competition and on other subjects. Um, I do believe it's a huge fallacy to think that every time we create a new institution, everything becomes better. You know, the, the, the opposite is true. And we can see this, for example, in the split between the commission and the external action service. And I would also say here, you know, to create yet another institution, it will only multiply 
the number of actors, and that in itself is nothing good in a world where the platform economy uses multipurpose technology, namely AI, it will be everywhere, and is multi-sided. So I would say we have to think the other way. We have to start thinking about moving away from this, you know, civil servants dash politicians hobby that, you know, for my file, I also create my institution. Yeah, that is the old way for the old economy of thinking about enforcement. And, you know, this has been done in all areas of EU law, whenever there's a legal act on consumers, on equal opportunities, on data protection, on telecom, on this and that, we create an institution with it. And now we have in the platform uh, digital economy, we have so many actors, they all have the same clients. You know, the, the, the platforms are clients of all these regulators and it's a mess. So I must say, I'm quite happy if we can move forward in this proposal and leave this thing with the commission, because then the commission does at least competition and this, and it's a unitary body. And that's a huge progress. That is not a weakness. That is a strength. Look at the FTC. In America, they are now, I would say, lucky enough to have consumer protection, privacy and competition in one house because it also has one huge advantage. You know, the guys, the other guys are learning from the hardcore competition guys, you know, and that is an advantage. So I would plead uh, for maintaining it uh, this way. And. A last remark on making... We have to move to the next... Uh, yeah, a last remark on making things work when an institution is in place, because that's not the only issue. We also have to think about mechanisms which ensure that the institution afterwards is under legal pressure to work. Um, and in GDPR, the big progress in comparison to the directive was that we have created a right of the citizen to a decision. And by the way, I don't agree with Jana that, you know, if you have been waiting for three years, you can actually bring a case. Um, you don't need a fixed deadline written um, uh, in a text to be able to uh, bring a case for non-action. So let's not only have an institutional discussion, but let's think about kinetics, what triggers what, and how can we motivate the institution, which then is the enforcer, also to act afterwards. That we have to work on too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is, of course, a dynamic we see also with the GDPR, that there is a lot of pressure also in particular from, uh, you know, NGOs and individuals on Absolutely. the functioning of the system. And that is a very interesting feature also maybe to... To, to make a comparison. Uh, Eliska, you're, uh, you're next, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me well. Um, and please, those who had some technical difficulties at the beginning, don't worry about it. I'm usually the one who has the biggest difficulties with big blue buttons. So I'm giving the warning in advance if there is any technical glitch. Um, so I agree with many points that have already been uh, raised and uh, access now together with other civil societies very much agree with the point that enforcement mechanism of DSA was sort of a sidetrack topic from the beginning. Um, and we actually issued the position on the how in our view the enforcement mechanism should look like even before the DSA was actually launched. Um, and many other civil society players were thinking how to actually learn from the past GDPR mistakes that the legislation that is also often called a legislative success, but unfortunately to a large ex extent enforcement failure. Um, and many other elements were already named by academia and other players in the field why that's the case, uh, besides the lack of funding and adequate resources provided to data protection authorities at the national level. The issue is much more complex with the problematic uh, so-called one-stop shop mechanism and also the lack of harmonization between these national procedures. Uh, Access now regularly published a report uh, on enforcement of the GDPR um, and this is the ongoing research that is being updated on a yearly basis and we identified throughout these years four main reasons why we see GDPR enforcement mechanism lagging behind. And these precisely four bases are a good start for uh, the future of the DSA to actually learn from. So these are definitely the inadequate communication exchange between these national authorities.
authorities. Then, of course, the lack of strict deadlines to answer the request for investigation and enforcement that is already somehow mitigated by the DSA, and I definitely agree with Jana, then a lot of progress has been done by the European Parliament uh, in that sense. Um, there is, of course, still differences and some level of contradictions between the national procedures. And finally, uh, ongoing difficulty with determining companies' main establishment. So we have Irish problem, so the issue of corporate capture, we have the Luxembourgish problem, and some commentators also point out to those countries that are currently experiencing so-called democratic backsliding without pointing a finger into any concrete directions, uh, where we often see that in the field of the content governance, uh, when it comes to the appointment of future digital coordinators, often these actually falls on the existing media regulators within the member states of the European Union that, however, similarly to some DPAs lack the enough resources or even experience with the platform governance issue and content governance issues. Um, so all of these imposes a big question mark and also a question what we can realistically expect from the DSA as these upcoming regulation that seeks to change the platform governance within the EU as we know it and what kind of uh, basis for this enforcement are truly realistic. Um, so uh, DSA, just to quickly wrap up, something that doesn't really have to be elaborated further for anyone um, in this panel is that there are sort of a layered system of the enforcement. There is a system at the national member states level uh, that to a large extent does follow the example set by the GDPR. So it creates also the coordinator of the establishment. Uh, but uh, it also mitigates certain things that uh, we identified with the GDPR that are actually creating all these obstacles within the enforcement. And what I would like to pay specific attention today is that enforcement layer over the very large online platforms where precisely the enforcement mechanism of DSA relies on the more centralized role of the European Commission. Um, we as civil societies are always here to uh, make sure that the accountability systems and independence of public authorities is in place and that there is enough meaningful transparency, not only imposed on the online platforms, but also on individual member states and the way how they actually exercise these enforcement mechanisms. And while I agree that to some extent centralization might be necessary, I disagree slightly with the point that European Commission is uh, uh, so much independent. First and foremost, European Commission is the executive branch of the, Euro of the European Union's power. Um, and we still impose more and more question what part of the Commission or the unit, the independent monitoring unit, will be actually responsible for what parts of the enforcement, especially when they exercise monitoring over very large online platforms. Um, we do see a need for such a a more centralized independent body and that's something that I also want to underline and whether that will be in the form of European platform super agency or whether it will actually look a bit differently that's also something we need to actually address and answer in the following months years to come uh, nevertheless, I think it's extremely important to distinguish what such a centralized enforcement can do and can oversight. And in our view, we definitely see the space for creation of a public independent auditor, someone who can actually really oversight how very large online platforms comply with their due diligence obligations, whether this is connected to the risk assessment or conducting independent audits, or even to administer the access framework that currently exists under the DSA framework, which is the only way how to actually establish a proper accountability mechanism. On all of these, we definitely need the need to create such a body that would actually hold these oversight function, uh, but we are not exactly sure whether it's a good or realistic idea to bring all of those other enforcement functions under the one umbrella of one centralized institution, because it might as well actually create the problems that we all know, but in the center of Brussels. Um, so this would be just first introductory remarks, um, and I'm happy to continue this further in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, so we'll, we'll quickly go to our final uh, speaker for his opening remarks. Please, Elliot, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I have much less uh, expertise on the DSA than my co-panelists, so I'm instead going to cover uh, previous international experience with GDPR enforcement, uh, in particular in the field of ad tech. 
So back in 2018, when GDPR came into force, uh, we've led a month-long long, um, work um, submitting a number of data subject access requests to data blockers, ad tech companies, and credit rating agencies um, in order to investigate their um, data processing practices. And uh, we found a number of issues with what all of these companies were doing, which ended up basically with us uh, submitting seven complaints uh, in Europe to three data protection agencies in France, the UK, and Ireland. And uh, among those complaints, only a few actually led to investigations. So the Irish DPC, for example, uh, started an investigation on Quantcast. France started one on Criteo. But among all of those, only one actually ended up in some sort of enforcement. And that was the ICO uh, in the middle of last year that... Uh, um, sorry, launched an, uh, uh, an enforcement notice against a number of credit rating agencies in the UK. Uh, but even then, this uh, enforcement hasn't actually been followed up. Uh, Experian, uh, one of the credit rating agencies that was being investigated, appealed this decision, and they were in a hearing last year. So uh, we literally haven't seen any form of enforcement on this side. No, more recently, over the past two years, we've been doing technical research on uh, publishers, so websites uh, that are kind of the front end of uh, tracking based um, um, targeted advertising. So we've looked at websites dealing with mental health, more specifically with depression, and more recently we've looked at websites uh, that were publishing diet uh, related ads. And um, this resource was basically focused on looking at the number of trackers that were on this website by default with, without any sort of human interaction. Uh, and we looked at the data that was being collected in quizzes and surveys. So for example, in the first research, we looked at depression tests offered by these websites and where the answers offered by uh, users were going. And what we found is that a number of these websites actually share direct answers with third parties that are unnamed without any form of consent that is being requested beforehand. Um, and again, we submitted a complaint, notably against Doxissimo, uh, one of the biggest health-related websites in France. And um, despite having regulators telling us that investigations have started, uh, we haven't seen any kind of enforcement. Now, the good side of this story is that because this research got a little bit of media attention, companies actually change their practices, but that's not enforcement in the sense we're talking about today. Um, so it's it, for us, it's pretty problematic about Sorry? You, you started breaking up just the last sentences. Uh... Okay. Um, is it okay now? Yeah, I think you're back. All right, so uh, to conclude, basically, for us, we see three main reasons, and I mean to e e echo what Eliska and, and I said, but like the, the reasons for us is that um, the data agencies have limited resources. They, they keep telling us that. They keep telling us that they're investigating a number of issues at the same time, and it's hard for them to focus on something. Uh, we've also observed a lot of uh, lack of coordination between data protection agencies. And it's really a shame when we're looking at actors like data brokers or ad tech companies who have like a global presence and uh, whose case would need to be assessed by uh, multiple regulators at the same time. And finally, uh, we've assessed that the, the complexity of the ones, uh, ones is probably hard for regulators to, again, coordinate and uh, and basically take action against these uh, global companies. So, yeah, that's that's it for me, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick note, your your camera is also frozen. I, I don't, it's, it's, it's fine. Your picture is fine that we're seeing, but uh, maybe you want to try to uh, to get it to work uh, again. Yeah, so no. that was uh, that was really quite a lot uh, put on the table. So maybe maybe I want to kick off with one uh, with one question about how uh, how you're all imagining uh, you know this new kind of uh, digital service coordinator entities and also the new kind of European level enforcement agencies which type of people uh, should we see within uh, those uh, agencies you know like this is a this is it's not data protection enforcement if data protection enforcement had a long history 
you know, with uh, uh, of rules. And, and I mean, those those agencies existed for a long time. But those, uh, you know, enforcement, enforcement uh, structures for the DSA, it is uh, somewhat of a new uh, beast uh, with different types of uh, expertise also uh, being needed. Um, so uh, what is your what is your imagination uh, in terms of those institutions? You know, what kind of expertise, what kind of uh, but 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 what should, what should we expect and what should we hope for and what should we wish for and what should we maybe be be worried about uh, when thinking about those uh, those agencies? That maybe like as a question to to bring it to life a little bit too, because in the end uh, there's going to be people uh, in those uh, in those agencies having to do uh, certain work and and creating a favorable enforcement environment uh, for the whole ecosystem in Europe. Who would like to pick up on that? Uh... Well, I can uh, give you my experience from GDPR uh, here. Um, it is actually a huge problem that uh, many of the data protection authorities uh, are run by people who have absolutely no enforcement background. And the fact that these authorities are old doesn't change anything. There was a gentle woman and gentleman's culture before GDPR, you know, we have a cup of coffee, we agree, and basically no judgments which were of contentious nature whatsoever, which tells you everything about, you know, let's keep life nice. Uh, so I have always said we have to change this culture for, for DPAs. We need, uh, you know, former prosecutors, uh, you know, deputy head of the competition authority. We need people who are ready for conflict and ready to go for hard hand, but also who know how to document evidence and how to do investigations and enforcement work in such a way that it stands in a court. And I think we need this type of people in the DSA enforcement uh, uh, bodies and coordinators bodies too. And uh, I think there will be some more discussions about this because, you know, the vexed thing is that DSA, there's also an element of industrial policy always in the background and, you know, let's talk and be nice. But I would say, look, guys, you know, we have learned ethics doesn't do it. And talking, you know, and being nice with each other, no. We need, if we make laws, we need hard enforcement readiness. Not unreasonable hardness, but readiness. And so that means we need people who are able and willing to stand the conflict and who are able and who know and who have the professionalism to investigate in such a way that they are able to take a tough enforcement decision and then also win in court. And that is a different type of person than those who love to give the other's next speech at the school and the university and inform and go to the next conference of all the DSA enforcers and talky, talky, talky. So I would say we need people of action. You want uh, you want an enforcer with uh, some teeth at least, uh, Jana. Absolutely. Please. You want Jana? You wanted to come in as well on this. Yeah, if if I can add to that, uh, Joris, I think you already answered your own question partly, uh, <laughs> and the name of the new enforcement agent, uh, the name of the new enforcement entities are very fitting. They're called coordinators. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we might uh, might face in the with the DSA enforcement in general is that, as you said, there are so many different uh, backgrounds of expertise that we will need. And I completely agree with uh, with Paul that, of course, at the head of these institutions, we need people with teeth and with appetite for proper enforcement. But all the um, the entire hierarchy below, of course, we need the technical expertise. We need people that um, have backgrounds uh, in uh, computer sciences. We need pe people that have backgrounds in media regulations and so on and so forth. And um, the the DSA already foresees the possibility uh, or the likelihood of there being more than one um, competent authority per member state and says that they would just need to organize themselves and uh, just have one um one DSC that will also represent them uh, at the board, for example. But that means that, and in comparison to GDPR, where we have a pretty clear-cut uh, legal field that people can work in and have been working in for 
for years. Um, under the DSA, we will have many uh, fields of legal expertise, for example, that uh, that are being concerned here. So we will not only have um, the issue of uh, having to, to coordinate um, between member states, for example, and joint investigations or coordinate at the board level. We will also have uh, this need for close cooperation within one member state uh, between between many different already existing authorities. Some member states might uh, create a new authority to be the DSC. Some might uh, build up on existing authorities. But in any case, there will be many different authorities concerned on the member state level. So we really need a close cooperation there. And we've already seen uh, from past experience that, of course, this is always cumbersome. It's always a bit slow. There's always this issue of basically translation between different authorities because they just have different working styles, they have different approaches to things. Um, and um, I think this is something we will need to look out for. Eliska, did you want to come in as well? Yes, I, I just would like to add to uh, to those great points that have already been raised by two previous speakers that perhaps uh, indeed uh, the number of uh, specializations and experts that will actually have to work on the enforcement of the DSA is quite large. And that's another reason why, in my view at least, there is definitely considering uh, or worth of considering to see uh, on one hand enforcement over compliance with the obligation within the DSA that could be indeed left with some independent enforcement unit at the commission level and at the same time having actually that individual body so-called we could call it transparency facilitator which is the term that comes from the algorithm watch for instance the organization that also proposes similar solution in that regard that would be then responsible for certain elements how to actually administer that buzzword of meaningful transparency that we all talk about and that DSA seeks to establish and there we can actually see and foreseen the role for the sort of agency that could administer that because if we speak about independent auditing of platforms that is envisioned within the DSA, that in itself is technically very complicated thing to actually enforce where if we want to actually use those independent audits to the large possible extent we need several expert bodies to be able to actually conduct those and at the same time a body that will be able to oversight how those exercises are being performed so we are not ending up with some checklist or completely privatized environment of audits that we saw also in the case of gdpr so um precisely due to that due to that large uh scope of different regulators and different necessary expertise in the place of dsa this would be actually one way how to think about it in the future so i think both actually have their uh, you know, deserved place when we discuss enforcement mechanism. It's just that we should not try to create a body that wants to do too much at once. Yeah. Ilaria, do you want to put the next question perhaps? Maybe uh, since we don't have a lot of minutes left, it would be good to uh, open it up to the audience and maybe there's someone who wants to Come forward with a question. Um, there, there is an interesting question on uh, the dig, uh, digital sing, single market directive on copyright, uh, how that relates uh, to this discussion. Maybe someone would like to answer that. Not an easy question. I think there was just a report from the European Copyright Society on the relationship between that directive and the DSA proposal. Um, I can say some words, uh, some words to the, sorry. Please, please go ahead. Um, of course, the general, uh, the general um, interlink between these two um, regimes is a bit complicated, in fact, and there is a good report on this out there. But in particular, in terms of enforcement, I don't think we have huge issues here because DSM is enforced uh, purely, I mean, is enforced on the member state level. It's a directive, right? So it was transposed into member state law. And um, it's more about the content of things. So as soon as we can clear up the interlink between those two uh, regimes in general, then I think we should also be fine uh, on the enforcement side of things. And then again, of course, at a member state level, no matter who will be appointed to be the DSC, of course, the media regulators will 
play their role uh, in the enforcement of the DSA as well, at least in just giving input and expertise to the DSC, if it's not them in the first place, uh, being the supervisory authority. There, there is a question about the importance of fines. Um, are there views on uh, the importance of fines uh, in all of this? Paul, you're muted. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you an anecdote. So while we were negotiating GDPR, some of the big tech companies came to me and said, oh, you know, we're never going to talk to the regulator if they can fine us. You know, that's not good for nice conversation. And uh, uh, and my answer was, yeah, sure. That's why you constantly talk to DG Competition, which can fine you 10% of world turnover. So actually, uh, you know, I believe in the possibility of high fines. Uh, it, it is conducive to the dialogue with the um, 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 authority, and it's also uh, helpful um, in making, uh, bringing about real change. You know, in enforcement, nothing is perfect. But, you know, better have the hard hand possibilities uh, because, uh, you know, nothing just changes because we have a nice coordination. Um, so I, I, I just also want say one thing about this constant uh, excitement in civil society about independence. I think it's a huge misunderstanding. Independence from what? From political oversight? I mean, hello, normally... All enforcement of law by public bodies is part of political responsibility. So why are we giving the benefit to the digital economy and constantly say, oh, we need independent enforcement? Hello, that means we are setting up weak bodies which are out there in the landscape instead of making them part of the pre-existing strong state. I think that, you know, you guys, you have to rethink this uh, a little bit. There is nothing good in this, uh, you know, oh, and another body which is independent and another body independent. Those, they, they are just weak. The normal enforcement, you know, think of tax enforcement. Think of uh, enforcement of, you know, phytosanitary. I mean, any type of public law is normally enforced by the state full stop. And there's a political responsibility of a minister that the enforcement takes place and they got to be tough. Yeah. And in the moment you create an independent body, you get this problem of these bodies out there and, you know, where is the line to democracy? So I would say, you know, there is a misunderstanding. This word independence, it sounds great, but it has a very limited positive function. It can be very detrimental to create all these weak bodies outside the direct political accountability to parliament. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's obviously, um, I mean, there's, there's some, there's some, some good reactions to that in the chat. Let maybe I'll, I'll let that, uh, kind of happen. I, maybe just another point <coughs> to bring up, uh, also considering, uh, what you said in the beginning, Elliot, about, uh, you know, your engagement with Privacy International within the GDPR kind of enforcement ecosystem. The DSA has a lot of this, you know, kind of, it has this whole imagination of other actors playing an important role in uh, the enforcement uh, of the DSA. Uh, there's a particular role also for academics. They get uh, no researchers, they get uh, potential access to certain data that they can start to use to do research about uh, dynamics on dominant platforms. I think there is also a, a role imagined uh, for civil society. So it's like it's really a bigger it's a bigger ecosystem of actors that that has to play uh, some role uh, in this. So Elliot, could you speak to that? Uh, and 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 what do you think about uh, the current uh, uh, situation? And, and what is your experience with that uh, from working in the GDPR context? So I'd like to read it, but my expertise about the DSA is fairly limited. <laughs> so I've done a bit of reading before this panel, but it's definitely not on par with my uh, co-speaker here. But my impression is that um, what the DSA is and in terms of uh, enforcement when it comes to the topic we researched at least. So I'm talking at tech 
and um, surveillance-based uh, online advertising. I feel like it's still missing out on a, a big statement, should I say. Like, what the some of the things we've observed is that there is a lack of agreement between the DPAs on what is lawful or not lawful and what the DPR actually means and how it should be enforced. And I don't think the DSA is necessarily addressing this in a better way. Um, and so, sure, data sharing with academics uh, uh, being sort of um, protected or, or set up by uh, such uh, a text might be a good thing, but we're still not addressing the core issue of online data collection and profiling and all of the data processing used and follow from this. And I don't, I, like from my limited understanding, I think this is still missing out and it's not going to be uh, helpful for GDPR enforcement in the future. Thank you. We, we, are, we are almost out of time already. We have five minutes left. So maybe, I mean, we're, we're of course, we're in the middle of this still, you know, like we just had the European Parliament plenary vote uh, with some exciting uh, improvements, I think, uh, that uh, we can be excited about. Um, there's going to be trialogue. Um, what is still possible and what, uh, what, uh, what are you aiming for in, uh, in that uh, particular context? Maybe that is a nice question to, uh, to close with. What is still possible in the coming months uh, in terms of improvements, also in particular on these, uh, on these issues that we've been speaking about? Uh, if I may, if I may um, start, um, of course, if we are now discussing whether or not we like the commission in this role, uh, it's, of, um, it's of scientific value, but it, we won't be able to change that anymore with trilogues. We have the EP in the council mandate and the commission text and our only negotiating power will be between these three texts, right? So we will end up with the commission uh, being in this, uh, in this role. And I think um, what's worth investing now is how we can... Um, how we can make that a sound role, how we can maybe still introduce some safeguards that Alishka was talking about, how we can uh, further ensure independence and so on. So there's uh, between the text, of course, there's very limited uh, room for introducing new ideas, but uh, I'm hopeful that we can uh, work out in some of the recitals, maybe some clarifications uh, into what we actually expect from the from the commission and um one thing that i that i regret uh, that it did not find um its way into the final text was um that i would have really valued or we would have really valued a review clause also in regards to the enforcement chapter because as everyone i think uh, today point rightly pointed out it is a huge challenge we shouldn't blindly follow uh our learnings from GDPR, but we should also acknowledge them. The challenge is to kind of uh, kind of find our way through here, anticipate what's uh, what's about to come. So, being able to, after a couple of years to sit down again and review whether the enforcement chapter that we the enforcement system that we came up with makes sense, whether it makes sense, uh, and then how far it makes sense to give these powers to the Commission. If it's working out fine, uh, to see whether maybe this uh, unit that will end up uh, working on these things in the commission could be outsourced at a certain uh, point in time in the future. All of these are questions that um, will be way harder to answer if, uh, if we're not able to properly review the text without opening up the entire, uh, the entire file again. But, yeah. Thank you. That uh, that's that's insightful and 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 seems uh, those are seem to be very reasonable objective. Uh, I uh, we have like two minutes left, and uh, but I want to give uh, each of the speakers just a chance to uh, say some final things. So maybe one two sentences each. Eliska, please. You. So very practically speaking, what's next for us is to sit down what we, what we are actually already doing, very closely compare European Parliament position with the Council position, realistically assess where we need to invest our powers, continue promoting those safeguards I mentioned today in the context of the enforcement, but also other priorities that we have, and hoping that we will actually create a check and balance system, a mechanism that where I will repeat independence plays a significant role because without independence there will be no proper accountability in my view. Um, and someone even mentioned article 8.3 of the Charter of the EU So um, in the chat. So uh, all of them will be in hands of the 
we're looking forward to cooperate with the Commission as well as with the European Parliament on getting the best possible law on regulating platforms and especially protecting users and their empowerment uh, at the end of this process. Thank you. Uh, one sentence each. Elliot, Paul. I like Paul Go. I don't think I have anything valuable to add to this discussion, <laughs> but thank you for my panel. <laughs> if you want a strong enforcer, uh, I think it's good to leave enforcement power in the Commission, look at competition, look at infringements against member states, anything else are schnapps Ideen. Uh, also, the Commission is the most independent body. It's a strong body which is not easily captured. It's not a small, you know, regulator who... Mm -hmm. So, you know, think about a, this. A consistent, uh, a consistent message, Paul. I, I, I am not entirely sure that you convinced everybody uh, in the audience. Obviously this, not. But this was, uh, this was <laughs> a fantastic uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, with the DSA Observatory, we will continue working on this topic. I want to thank you very much. Thanks very much in particular to the speakers, but also to the audience for um, and joining the panel and engaging and um, let's close it uh, for this. Thank you very much.